What does it take to make workshops work? And how can we facilitate collaboration that sticks and leads to results? My name is Miriam Hapness, and with the Workshops Work podcast, I'm on the mission to find the magic ingredients that make workshops work. Today with me on the show is Jimbo Clark, and we talk about boxes, inside the box, unfolding the box, outside the box, and what it means for facilitation and for personal growth. Don't miss this episode. And if you don't have pen and paper ready to take your own notes, scroll down to the show notes to download my free one-page summary. Now, lean back and enjoy. It's worth every minute, I promise. Jimbo, welcome to the show. I'm so happy to be here. I am looking forward to talking about boxes. <laughs> I'm looking forward to hearing a little bit about, you know, your conference too. If, if Are you willing to share some highlights about that? Sure. Later. First things first. Yeah. First, it's okay. about you. <laughs> okay. All right. Then you get to ask me some bonus questions. I don't want you to think I don't listen. <laughs> <laughs> Let's test that. Um, okay. When did you start calling yourself a facilitator? I met a facilitator who's kind of like my godfather in facilitation. His name is uh, Larry Philbrook. He works with the Institute of Cultural Affairs, ICA. They propagate the um, TOP, Technology of Participation Methodology. I met him in 95, 94, and we started reading a book together and just getting together. And then I actually introduced him to the company I was working in, and I got to understudy from him. So I was hanging up posters and, you know, uh, cutting paper and doing all the things that you do to prepare for facilitation. And about two years into that process, I said, you know, I want to be a world-class facilitator and trainer. And I told him and my other godfather, who's on the training side, a guy named David Neenan in America, I told them both, this was my goal. I want to be world-class. And so I just ended up shadowing the two of them and then shadowing a number of other facilitators and, and, and trainers and just saying, can I do music? Can I, can I hang up posters? And then after a while, they'd say, well, if you want to, you can do this piece or you can do that piece. And eventually, I think there was a, there was a moment in time where I took these two styles, the accelerated learning training style and the very process facilitation style and put it together and created a training and well, facilitation. and. And at the end of that, I thought to myself, you know what? I'm a facilitator and people tell me I'm world-class. So, all right, there you go. <laughs> you know? Yeah. What a nice story. And I like the label of godfather instead of mm. mentor. What's for you the difference? Like a godparent. You know, if you think about a godparent, I don't mean godfather like the movie, The Godfather. I think about like a godparent, you know, a godparent doesn't have, you know, a uh, DNA in the game. It's no genealogy in the game, but there's some kind of a relationship where there's something special. And it, it's not like I chose, I didn't choose, I, I do have godparents. I didn't choose them. My parents chose them. And I'd like to think the universe chose, you know, Larry and, and David as kind of my, my, my godparents in all of this, just by being willing to give me chances and just by, by challenging my assumptions so much and, uh, and modeling being a really, really, really decent human being. They're both such giving people. And so I, I think both of the people that I modeled myself were, were were not into facilitation to make money. They they made money because they were good at it. Mm. And very generous, very extremely generous. And I think what a great, what a great grounding to have outside of the process side of it, but just being generous. Mm. And I thank you for sharing that. I can totally see it because the godfather, godparent connotation also has something like a long-term commitment, has responsibility. The mentor is more short-term binding. And also what you said about the making money, they made money because they're good at it, uh, resonates so much with me. Also, because for me, that's part of the facilitator's mindset. The moment mm. where you let go, where you just do because you want to achieve the best for the group, you let mm. go and then you're achieving the best. The moment where you're not trying to make money, you'll become good at it. Mm. And then the money will come. 
Yeah. Because you can give it all. Yeah. And that, and that's a, di- I think, I think that's such a differentiator, maybe even between like, like the difference between a trainer and a facilitator. I think, I think trainers facilitate and facilitators train, but there's a different mindset mm. and that the midwife is, is a, is a metaphor that the ICA uses a lot as a facilitator. So facilitator is a midwife. It's not your baby. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, you're just trying to do everything you can to deliver this new thing to the world in a way where you protect the safety of the parents the, and, and you give it the best possible chance for survival and growth. And and to enable the parents to be there and to do the best to yeah. protect and nurture this baby yeah. idea. Yeah. And that could mean some education that should, that could mean some, you know, Hey dad, you got to do this or, you know, whatever in that fragile moment. But then after that fragile moment, I think it's good for us to, to walk away, you know, and let the real, let the real people do the work, you know, <laughs> let the real parents get to the work of it. And uh, yeah, I fell in love with open space technology in, in 2000 and you know, the, the sign of a good open space meeting is in the closing circle. Nobody mentions you as a facilitator, mm. you know? So if you, when that happens, when, when they go around and they talk about how they've done all these wonderful things and no one mentions, you know, my contribution or my, or the team's contribution, I'm just like, woof, yes, that's success. Right. Yes. And, and again, it is mindset. It's the most beautiful thing, but it means to let go of ego. Because the mm. only one who will celebrate you is yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My mom passed a few years, so I guess so. <laughs> because <laughs> my mom would have celebrated me. Yeah. Yeah, but, but you're right. The group, as as you mentioned, it's if the group yeah. forget that you're there, then you're proud of yourself. But you're the only one who can yeah. nurture this kind of pride. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned the world-class facilitator. So what is it for you that sets someone apart? What makes someone world-class in facilitation? Oh, well, I don't know. That's a, <laughs> I set myself up for that, didn't I? Well, that's a really interesting question. I, mean, I, I came up with that phrase, world-class, you know, this is like 95, 90, actually 98 was when I think I, I said that. And from the facilitator standpoint, you know, I've seen so many different people with so many different approaches and so many different spirits, so many different energies, so many different you know, ways of being. I've seen facilitators that can be super confrontational and very direct with, with the group and very direct with, with the leader or whatever. And I've seen others that are like, you know, Tai Chi masters who, you know, are just, you know, flowing around the group. And so I don't think I could really give a good description. I guess the way that I would put it, and this sounds really strange, is it's a person I would really like to work and play with. Mm -hmm. It's a person who has honed their craft and they have their voice and they have their presence and they they have their way of dealing with their own doubts and their own shadow. You know, they know that they have a shadow and they're, you know, they're okay with it. I think, um, Prince, I'm I'm a huge Prince fan. In one of uh, Prince's songs, he says, I know from righteous, I know from sin, I got two sides and they're both friends. And I think, you know, the facilitators I know are like all humans, they're flawed beasts, but they have a level of self-awareness and love for themselves and for the group in all of our whole and incompleteness, you know, it's a, it's a, it's that whole thing where we're, we're complete and incomplete at the same time. And being able to sit in that, I don't know if any of that made any sense, but it's, it's a tough question. And I think it makes a lot of sense. And because to me, what I hear from your words is that it's not about what we are doing, but the way how we're doing it and mm. how we are saying it and how we deal with the stuff happening between our ears why we mm. charge of a group. So it's a lot about self-awareness, about mindset, about maturity. Yeah, and, and even that sense of, you know, depending on how you how you take the word in charge of a group, you know, there's the sense of in charge in terms of control, but then there's almost like the, a babysitter has their charges, right? Uh, yeah. And, you know, I, I never think of myself in charge of the group. The way I imagine myself when I'm facilitating is, 
you know, there's here's a group of individuals who may have some kind of connections to each other. And I say the group is smarter than any one of the group, including me. But when I join the group, I add my wisdom into the group. And so I shift the balance a bit. And so it's not about me leading the group. It's about me adding my energy into the group. And then have- yeah, and, and so then I need to model the energy I want from the group. I need to model the behaviors I want from the group because that's what mm-hmm. gets them to do it. Yeah. Somehow for me, the, the image of an amplifier came up where there's something in the group that's already there. But in order to to really come out and to take mm. form and shape, it needs an amplifier, something, a medium. Yeah. And the medium is partly the workshop as a structure in itself. Mm-hmm. So the design that we bring in, but the medium is also the facilitator. And then sometimes a group and this hidden wisdom of a group needs someone who's very daring and present and sometimes they yeah. need someone who's rather leading from the back of the room almost invisible yeah oh yeah and sometimes you have to be both i mean there are times where they only got you <laughs> and so you know as a facilitator yeah we have to stretch out of our comfort zones to play the role that the group needs as opposed to bringing the group into our comfort zone yeah and I became aware of you by some, I don't know who it was. I wish I could mm. recall. Someone told me, Miriam, do you know Jimbo Clark? The guy with the box. <laughs> the box guy. <laughs> you need to talk The to box him. guy. Yeah. So I think that's already um, something, right? If, um, if you have your own label and someone refers to you as such. So what is it that this box guy thing about what's the box guy thing um the box recreating the box inside the box yeah in and out of the box unbox live be unboxable there's a lot of we could talk about boxes for a long time um this is i, th- I think in 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 life in general but i think in the world of facilitation in particular wonderful things happens from the position of yes And I had a client that asked me, can you do a program for us on out-of-the-box thinking? Right now, we are all thinking in silos. We need to think out of the box. And I said, yes, of course I can. It's what I do best. (laughs) And then then I went back home and I was like, well, what am I going to do? You know, And, and on the floor near my desk, there was an empty paper box, like an A4 paper box. And I was thinking, what is the box that you're supposed to think out of? And I took this box, I just kind of stuck it on my head. And I said, so this is in the box and this is out of the box. And in, and so I started to think, oh my God, this, it's like it's like scuba diving or snorkeling. You know, there's there's this world and there's this world. And, and it was that, it gave me that kind of feeling of, wow, in the box is like this. And then I had this idea, <laughs> I'm going to put boxes upon their heads. It will be fabulous. And so I, you know, I bought a bunch of box cutters and cardboard, and I just brought in big sheets of cardboard, just blank cardboard, and said, you know, your boss, you know, he was in the room. You know, David wants us to think out of the box. Let's build the box we're supposed to think out of. And so they just took cardboard and started cutting holes. And and to be honest with you, I didn't even know how to make a box out of a flat piece of cardboard. I figured just let them figure it out. And I really thought it would take maybe 45 minutes to an hour for the whole process of building and talking, you know, put it on, take it off. It was like a three hours that we, you know, that we went through and it was really powerful, but there was two other things. So it was powerful on the one hand, but you know, it was, it was a diamond in the rough. I could tell that there was so much underneath the surface that we couldn't touch. Um, I didn't know how to get it to it. And that really frustrated me that, that, that there was some beauty in there, but then the photos were so cool. And I added it into my, into my presentation deck when I met new clients. And, said, oh, and then we put boxes on people's on there. Oh my God, what's this? And like, it was so sticky. And so, so people saw those photos and especially the more senior, the leader, the more they were interested in it. Like, oh my God, I want, yes, I experience this every day. I need my people to get the box off their head. Yes, I want to do this. And so it was really just saying yes 
to an idea and trying it out and then finding out that it was sticky and then spending about four or five years iterating it, you know, before I became the box guy, you know, was, yeah. I love the story. Thank you so much. <laughs> and everyone who's I got to this uh, audio only, jump over to YouTube to watch, <laughs> to watch the video to that. I use my hands like Kermit the Frog, you know, it's like my hands are going everywhere. Yeah. Love it. So much to unpack. So what have you learned from the leadership's reaction to that? Oh, yeah, this is something because I hear this craving maybe for novelty, for maybe something different, something a little bit daring and some yes. put your finger on a wheel pain. I think that's a piece of it. That daring for creativity. I, I live in Taiwan. My primary markets have been Hong Kong, Shanghai, Singapore, Beijing, Shenzhen, for, for, as I was developing this product. And I think part of what attracted people to it is you're talking about your unconscious bias. You're talking about your unconscious boundaries. You're talking about mindset. You know, we've said the word mindset 26 times here. How do you get people to reflect on their mindset? It's so unconscious. I mean, it's, it's, I, um, and so, yeah. So the, the wonderful thing about the box is there is this really easy to understand metaphor of thinking in a box that's based on my experience, my background, my perspectives. And so even if you're not a native English speaker and you've never heard the phrase, think out of the box, you can get this this metaphor very, very quickly that I protect myself with my thinking and I, you know, have my unconscious biases. And then to be able to open up that box and to write out and to share what those boundaries are and what's stopping you and what your, what your fears are and what your, you know, how you make your decisions and, and, and what are the key experiences in your life that have changed you? These are kind of deep for conversations, but the box allows you to get there in about an hour. Because you're just playing with it. And then all of a sudden you're talking about, you know, your past or you're talking about your, your pressure points. Yeah. And um, this phrase just came to my mind that when you're inside the box, you cannot see the label. I think it's not about the box, but um, if you're inside the can, you don't see the label. That's Yes. Yes. It. Yes. Similar, right? And the box has an outside. And you know, it's, it's funny, for the first three years that I did this, I didn't want to spend any time on the outside because I was just, it was all about, you know, the box contains, the box contains. I brought in a bunch of my facilitator friends to my home and I said, yeah, I got this process. I'm trying to figure it out. Could you just help me? And the first thing they said after the process was, why didn't you let us spend more time on the outside? You know, I care what people see. I care about the outside. And then so that opened up a whole level of, of dialogue and thinking for me about how much of what stops us from getting what we really want in life is the label, is you know, what I want you to think about me and what I want others to see about me and what I want to hide and you know, all this branding that goes on and how much pressure you know, shows up from having the gap between what's on the outside and what's on the inside. You know, it's like... And, and so then that's, that's, again, that's a whole nother kind of conversation that's just so easy to talk about when you've got this physical thing that, you know, well, you, can see, you know, you can see the outside and what people want and you can see what's going on on the inside. And so then in our model, we would say that integrity is me putting more of my inside on the outside and authenticity is me allowing more of my reactions, my responses, my who I am right now to show out like letting my light shine from inside. Mm. And it, like in Chinese, integrity is a really tough concept in, in Chinese. But when you do it this way, so oh, it's just the more that's, that you have on the inside that's on the outside, the easier it is for people to know who you are and predict who you are. And it's easy for you to be yourself. Hey, since you are listening to this podcast, I was wondering whether you get enough opportunities to exchange, practice and experiment with other facilitators. Have you heard of the Never Done Before Facilitation Festival? It's a 24-hour global event that is co-created by its participants and delivered by some of the most popular workshops work podcast guests. Visit neverdonebefore.org for more information. Use the code 
workshops work to get a 20% discount. The festival starts as soon as you join. Now, back to the show. Also then with all these issues of cognitive dissonance, if we know that the outside world sees who we want to be, then it's easier to stick to these rules. Yeah. Consistent. And I wonder where does the real magic come from? Is it this change in perspective, as you mentioned, where you first see everything, then you see this restricted world through the holes, and then you see everything again? Or is it the um, really the process of crafting the box? So is it the process or is it the result, basically? So the process of crafting the box is like the IKEA effect, you know, and and so they they care about it. And the more time you give them with the box, the more they care about it. And it becomes it becomes an artifact that is like a representative of of me. Like the Billy. And so, yeah. And th th there's such a nice gradient because usually we start on the outside and people are drawing themselves and putting some different things about them. So th your public self, you know, if I were to follow you for a day, what would I hear you say? What would I hear you do? You know, who are you on a good day? Who are you on a on a bad day? What do people see? And these are things that are so easy to talk about. So then when you, they enjoy the drawing and they're, and then when they're, when you get them to share with each other, it's like a cocktail party, you know, it's like the energy levels, like, because so much of this is rehearsed, you know, and then you start going on the inside and the, and the, the front is the filters. And these are the big experiences of my life and the big important parts of my current context, my experience now, my past and current experience. And now people start talking about, oh, you know, I was. I was the youngest of 11 kids. I was an only child. I, you know, I, you know, all these different kinds of stories that don't show up in the business, but impact who you are in the business. And then we talk about the left and the right. And that's how we make our quick decisions by positive and negative energy. And, you know, it's like values. It's, it's your preferences. It's, it's your judgments, you know, and what I want to avoid and what I want more of. And so then this starts getting to be even deeper. And then we go into the back of the box, which is about my pressure. I, I want this, but I think this. So I feel pressure. I'm stuck in the middle and people are coming out. So there's this gradient. So by the time they get to the back and they're talking about their pressure, it's like real. So that's the one magic piece is the gradient and the experiential side of it. And it's not just making it, but it's how every single thing on this box is a piece of me. Then the magic, other magic moment is, you know, we get everybody out and running around and they all got to go, you know, take pictures of themselves and do stuff. I used to have them play. I used to have them pass balls with boxes on their heads. <laughs> Now we just have them take pictures and stuff. And then you get them standing in a circle and you talk about how, you know, when you're in a meeting, you're looking through your filters and you've got your pressure and you've got your judgments and you're showing the best of you and you're hiding your dirty little secrets. And this is how we all show up in a meeting. This is how we all show up at work. And on the count of three, you know, we're going to take the box off. So ready? One, two, three. And there's this collective sigh of release as you take the box off. And then it's like, ah. Yeah. And then we unpack that. And so the unpacking is when you had the box on your head, what did you experience? But I couldn't really see other people. When you're under pressure, do you really see other people? And so we go back and forth with the experience of this thing on your head and, and how my brain reacts to pressure. And, it, and then all of a sudden they realize, oh my God, this is me under pressure. This is me on a bad day. This is me. And so then what am I going to do about that? And that becomes what we work on. But that moment's the magic. The, ah, yeah. Beautiful. And I can imagine this, this really, when you just described it, I, I got goosebumps just <laughs> from your explanation because like, I feel it. I feel yeah. this relief of finally I can put my mask down. Yeah. I can put the box yeah. off, but also meaning I can put the mask down. I can be myself. Yeah. Because I've sharing the inside with the outside, putting it on the box, on the outside labels mm. for others to see it, then I can put it off because it's everyone knows anyway. And then like, yeah. the conversation. So when we, we use this a lot at the beginning of, of like conferences or longer meetings, and the whole idea is that in this meeting today, we want to go into what we call open box thinking. Mm. And so I'm lowering my mask, lowering my face, And I'm being reflective. So as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking, what in my current thinking can I change? So mm -hmm. that's magic. 
And what I found intriguing is that you said we're going into open box and not out mm. box. No, no. The open yes. box meaning that we are opening up, being transparent about what's happening inside the box. And then the out of the box is just a natural next step. It's something that happens, but it's nothing that can be forced or can be right. created. What can be created is opening the box. Right. And then in the end, you're still going to put a box back on your head. You just want to put a better box. Mm -hmm. Right. And so so it's not about living out of a box because, you know, there's certain conventions in life that we do need to follow. You know, I still got to pay my taxes. You know, there's certain there are certain things. <laughs> yeah, I do. I, I definitely I definitely did. But we won't talk about that. You know, it's language is a part of my box, uh, my culture, my my dreams, my love for my kids, my, you know, all of these are things that are that are inside my thinking. And, and, and you know, my unconscious thinking helps me make thousands of decisions on a day. None of that is bad until it gets in the way of getting what I really want. And mm -hmm. but I use the word really because it's not not the superficial want. Usually our unconscious thinking is really, really good at getting us what we've got now or what we got in the past, but may not be aligned to the future. And so if my current thinking isn't aligned to my future vision, then I suffer. And so why not open up my thinking and say, oh, gosh, you know, I can't believe I still think this. I think I'll just take this one off for a bit. You know, maybe I should just let go of this. And oh, but here, I'll just think I put a new thought here, you know. And so so you rewrite the inside of your box. You give yourself a better vision. You let go of some of the boundaries that are holding you back. And then you give that a try, you know, and you put that into practice. Almost sounds like box building. <laughs> like body yeah. Building. yeah, reboxing. <laughs> Re yeah. Okay, that's what you mean by reboxing. Yeah, so reboxing is is you know building a better box, building a better frame of mind, building a better better mindset, building a facilitator's mindset. Mm. So a facilitator's mindset is not out of the box; it's in a different a different configuration of our thinking. Mm. What also comes to my mind is the concept that if everything is possible, nothing is possible. So yeah. if we don't have restrictions, then we cannot be creative because we yeah it's difficult to start so having a box actually and having this constraints and limitations helps us to structure and to be really creative but then yeah. sometimes it depends on the size of this box so if i understand you correctly it's actually really not about thinking outside the box because we don't want to be outside the box because then it's scary, right? We need the... Well, if you think, because let's go back to facilitation. If you think about a, a design of a facilitated process, there's going to be some part of that design that is usually vision or direction or end result oriented to make sure that the group is aligned to that. And then a step will usually be possibility thinking. Let's go out of the box. Let's think about what's possible. We're not making decisions now, right? So the out of the box part is not the decision making part. So in our thinking, we say first, you need to figure out what's your creative tension. What is that vision and what's holding you back? Once you have that, then you go out of the box to think of the creative ideas. And then you open the box and you, you lower your assumptions. And, you know, I had so many wonderful experiences with senior teams across Asia doing like strategic planning. And you, you could see them walking in, you know, finance and sales and marketing were all kind of, you know, posturing against each other. But as soon as they, and I'm not talking about the physical box, but in the process, there's a moment in time where they go from me to we, and suddenly resources become available and suddenly rules become flexible. And suddenly there's a movement towards the goal that didn't seem possible before the meeting. And to me, they've opened up their thinking. They've realized that I can be more, not necessarily transparent, but I can be more reflective around what you're saying and seeing if there's a, if there's a way of me sharing something or, 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 or contributing to that. So that's that open box. But then you still have to build the better box, which is the convergence and us coming up with some sort of, you know, so if this is the goal and these are our strategies, then we're going to have to stop doing some things and start doing other things. That start, stop, continue or whatever you want to call it, that's building a better box. You're building a new constraint for the future. And then you try that constraint out and then you see if it works. And if it works, then you go with it until it doesn't. 
And then you come into that point where you find out, God, this box is too small for me, or it's, you know, it's not serving me. And so then we go back through that process of going out and in and out and in. And it's like breathing, you know, for all of our life, there's these moments of divergent possibility thinking. And there's moments of, oh my God, I got to get something done. And this is just a, a physical metaphor for what we've been doing all of our lives. It's just making it conscious so you can actually make some strategic choices about your thinking as opposed to about your actions. And is this me to we moment then for a group? Because I think that's really the magic of a workshop. That's mm -hmm. the one point you want to achieve, the me to we. Yeah. Otherwise, you don't need a workshop. Is this the moment where the group and all the individuals realize that we are all having these boxes and we're actually, we're struggling with the same things? Or how do you... It depends. How do you make this me to we moment? Yeah, easy? it really depends because usually the box process is about a two and a half to three and a half hour piece. And that's mostly self-reflection and sharing in small groups. And it's mostly about kind of maybe moving from a capital M-E to a small M-E. <laughs> you know, if we can look at it that way, you know, it's it's about self-awareness. And then in some programs, that self-awareness is enough. Like the box is used for like inclusion and diversity and a lot of organizations where it's you know me becoming aware of how I'm viewing people from the outside as opposed to the inside and how do we open up and all of that. And so then there doesn't need to be that same kind of me to we thing as there would be if it's a strategic planning or if it was, you know, some goal achieving or if it was. So it what's been great for me as, as you know, a trainer of trainers in this process is people bring in their own expertise. I just had someone recently that met me and said, oh my God, this is perfect for mergers and acquisitions. It's so far away from my expertise. But as we started talking about it, then we, we mapped it out and, and, and you know what? It is. He had a great plan. And so now he's He's using this for mergers and acquisitions. So in that case, yes, there needs to be that we moment. But in other programs, maybe that understanding of me is enough. And maybe me coming up with some new ways of being is enough. I wonder whether the from capital me to lowercase me yeah. must include or always by definition includes the we, the broadening, the horizon, because it's. If yeah. I don't see myself as the capital, the only, the big one, I cannot mm. see myself smaller if without seeing the others around me and relating to them and seeing, okay, oh, we are actually all human. We are all wearing these boxes and masks. And Yeah. Yeah. In most of the processes, the part that I would say is, is the payoff, like the, you know, the, the payoff moment is after we've got them to reflect on their inner thinking and make some adjustments. Then we have them go back to the outside of the box and we ask four questions. And the first question is, if you make the changes on the inside, what new actions or behaviors will others see you do or what might you see yourself do? And the second question is, if you make the changes on the inside, what new things might you find yourself saying or how might you communicate differently? Uh, the third one is, if you make the changes on the inside of your thinking, what new feedback might you receive from others? And then and then the kicker, my favorite, I got goosebumps just thinking about it, is when you look your, at yourself in the mirror, what will you notice that's different, right? And so we give just people a chance. And so we don't do action planning. So in this process, the because what we're trying to do is we're trying to to redefine the boundaries of our thinking rather than coming up with actions. And the idea is if I, if I make some small change on my boundaries, then I'm going to see new opportunities and do new things and stop doing old things and, you know, get more of what I really want with less pressure. That's the gift. And so the way we get into actions is just by asking what would other people see and hear and experience. And then all of a sudden they find out, oh, you know, I won't yell at my kids as much or, you know, I'll tell my wife I love her or, you know, people would see me uh, laughing more and having fun at work. And people would see me saying yes or people would hear me saying no or you know, I'd look in the mirror and I'd smile at myself, you know. And, and so to me, that's the payoff mm -hmm. because so often and, and I think in, in a lot of our facilitated programs, too, we have two outcomes. One is an aligned vision. And the other is strategies and tasks to get there. And then the ethereal sense of team. But there's none of this 
like the enjoyment of the journey part, you know, me smiling or not yelling at my kids or saying no or yes. This is like, you know, sunshine when you're hiking as opposed to, you know, getting to the summit. You know, it's it's the movement towards as opposed to the result. Yeah. And I find people realizing that their lives can be better today with new thinking. That's the key. That's the key. Yeah. Thank you for pointing this out. And I think that's what's at the essence of what drives humans in general. Mm. Although we are so we seem to be so attached to the goal, it is actually all about the process. I think mm. that's also the reason why um I always wanted to in my my former days as a researcher, I always wanted to run an experiment to find out why people would buy these lottery tickets where you don't get the immediate result, but you have to wait for a week and sit in front of TV. Because my hypothesis would be that during this week, they're actually not buying the the probability of winning a million. They're buying mm. one week of dreaming about what they would do. Yeah. 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 So the this kind of process of enjoyment, this... Um, before we actually reach the goal is totally honest. Yeah. And that's what I think is driving what they're calling the great resignation. You know, I, I think of it as the great reconsideration right now. You know, people are reconsidering their relationship with work. Mm. And, you know, it's the same thing. It's like, wow, can I have a career and be a father? You know, can I do this and this? And I think the old thinking, especially in Asia where I live, you know, traditional thinking here is, You do your job to get paid so that you can do the things that you need to do. And if you have money left over, you can do the things you want to or like to do. And the idea that you could actually make different choices in your life and trade up instead of trade off, it's a new thinking. Yeah, it's a new thinking. And again, it's a mindset. I Recently, it was um, a few weeks before the festival. And mm. last year, by that time, I was totally stressed out, close to burnout, that mm. everyone around mm. me was really seriously worried. And after the festival, mm. my therapist said, Miriam, you're suffering from postnatal depression. <laughs> This year was different. And mm. I think one thing that made the difference was I woke up one morning with a revelation epiphany and I wrote mm. down on a sticky note, I don't need to be busy to be successful. Mm. And... Every day approaching life and business with, okay, so what can I do to be less busy and still successful? Yes. Do I really need to do that? Can I maybe outsource it? Yes. <laughs> can I Or can I just not do that? Can I just can I yeah, we'll do one last thing altogether? Yeah. And a total game changer. You, yeah. What a I great gift you've given yourself. To delegate more, to yeah. enjoy more, to dance more. Yeah. Yes. Two things come up as you, as you said. Well, first of all, I just want to say congratulations, because I think that you talk about how changing one thought can change so much. And you just see that as like the prime domino for so many other dominoes going to go tick -tick 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 and create so much space for life, and you know? Us. Yeah. Yeah. In open space, like I said, I fell in love with open space technology and Harrison Owen, the founder, used to always say, can we just do one less thing? It's not about doing one more. It's always about trying to find one less thing to do. Can we make it simpler? And I think that's a, I'm terrible at that because I've got this brain that always wants to make things very complicated, but eventually it gets pruned back with reality. Um, and then the other thought that I had about that was I read the book Blue Ocean Strategy back in 2004. And that was when my daughter was just born. My son was four years old and I decided that I quit my company And I was going to start my own business. And I realized that the one thing everybody had told me is spend time with your kids when they're young. And so we decided to homeschool our kids and work from home. And we decided to spend two months a year in Seattle where my parents live, where I just wasn't going to work. And so I would just spend a month, you know, my parents' sofa practically. I mean, we do other things, but, you know, just, you know, so I am just... Having my kids grow up in you know, borrowing Seattle for the beautiful summer months. And I would feel guilty about not being busy, about not having income. You know, that, well, for two months, I'm not making any money and I'm just spending money. And then there was a moment where that kind of epiphany, that post it note moment came where I said, where I went to, wow, isn't that great? 
<laughs> I was like, I'm getting away with this. You know, we still have money left over at the end of the year. You know, I'm still making more than I'm spending. You know, I have a great relationship with my kids. You know, I, I feel healthy. You know, maybe this is okay. Hmm. Maybe I don't have to work as hard as my colleagues. And so I just really, I really went about trying to structure how I do what I do to support me not having to do much. It sounds like a reboxing moment. <laughs> yeah. Where yeah. The box is you have to work in order to enjoy life. You have to be busy when you're successful. And what if it was easy? Yeah. This was the sticky note before the busyness. Mm. Also maybe yeah. you and for me, for me, my sticky note was I want it all. Mm. Oh, I want I want family. <laughs> I want family. I want, I want time with my family. I want to travel. I want, I want to provide for my family. I want, you know, I want to live a comfortable life, but I don't, I gave up the option of a luxurious life. Right. And it's, that was my trade up. I'll, I'll trade up from chasing a luxurious life to having a comfortable life, but living it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, actually I literally, this sounds really kind of creepy and weird because it's, it's actually true. I giggle to myself about how much I enjoy my life sometimes, you know, like I'm just sitting out there working on stuff. Like, oh my God, yeah, I'm going to get paid for this. <laughs> you know, so yeah, it's a good space to be in because then the money's not important and you can give and you become the best at giving what you can do. And then the money comes. Yeah. And then it's a yeah. virtual circle. Yeah. And then everything follows, right? So if you're happy with the inside Less of an effort to have this authenticity, which by definition and by how humans function creates trust from the outside because they see what, mm. hence everything that is integrity becomes easier. Yeah. Hence more trust, more openness, more effect. And even the shadow becomes easier. Yeah, you know, I'm looking at you there and there's your shadow right there. And, you know, right behind you, yep, there it is, right? And just the the acknowledgement and the understanding that I have shadow and I have bad days and I, 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 you know, I got these beautiful lights. But, you know, I mean, it's like, so when I work with, because a lot of the facilitators are trained in the box, they're not all of them, but there's a certain percentage of them that are maybe three to 10 years in the business that are looking for something new. And they're still really dealing with that imposter syndrome, right? Another word for imposter syndrome is just, you know, being a successful facilitator, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You're just a pioneer. You're saying yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you for staying tuned and listening to the show. I appreciate your attention as I know how busy you are. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe and engage by sharing your comments and thoughts and visit workshops.work to download the one page summary. I'm looking forward to seeing you back at the next episode and I wish you a fruitful day.